Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, first, we have a disclaimer that you're just participating in this webinar and I'm not actually giving legal advice, just uh, giving some information so that you guys can either use that um, to go speak with an attorney or do your own further research on the topic. And it's by me. Okay, so there's, uh, to start this off, the end game is how to sell a property from a trust. But we're kind of going to give an outline of what is a trust and go through the steps of kind of the basics of that um, to then get to the end point. So first off is what is a trust? A trust is a testamentary document that um, is created by a person or persons, so um, an individual or a married couple, to hold certain property in the name of the trust for their benefit or for the benefit of others, known as beneficiaries. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to use the Smith family as an example. Harry and Wendy are the husband and wife, and we have child one, two, and three. Usually, I like to use three children because it's a lot easier for examples. And in this whole scenario, Harry and Wendy have executed the Smith Family Trust. <clears throat> so, why do pe people create a trust? The main purpose is to avoid probate, manage the distribution of their assets, and there are some tax benefits. So what I'm mainly going to talk about is managing the distribution of assets. You can determine if you want your child, sibling, um, parent, or friend to be able to get your personal or real property and then they don't have to go through the probate process, which takes a long time, um, at least a year. And so the trust kind of circumvents that and allows you to pick and choose your beneficiaries. Um, it assigns tr the trustee certain duties and powers, and it can create a timeline for distribution. So if you want someone to have your bank account, the funds in your bank account at 25 and then again at 30, you can dictate those terms. Unlike in a will, um, you can do that, but then it just extends the probate process and it's a lot more complicated. So in order to circumvent that and just keep it easier, um, it's recommended to have a trust. So what are the basic um, requirements for a trust? First, you have to have the name of, um, the settler has to have the trust property. Um, you have to have intent to manifest, to intent to create a trust. Uh, you name the trustee and their duties. Um, it has to be a valid purpose. So bequeathing your property to your child, sibling, parent. Um, and you have to define the beneficiaries. So Harry and Wendy um, decided that they are going to create a trust for their benefit and the benefit of their children. Uh, they have named themselves as trustees, and if the children are young, then they'll probably name like a sibling as the successor trustee. But if the children are most likely over the age of 18, then they will name their children as the successor trustees. The trust property will be their home, their family home, any other property that they own, personal property such as jewelry, musical instruments, clothing, um, home furnishings, things like that. The purpose is to give them to the beneficiaries upon Harry and Wendy's death. And then the beneficiaries are their children or um, grandchildren, friends, things like that. If Harry and Wendy said, we would like to leave our musical instruments to Nick, that's not definitive enough because we don't know who Nick is. We don't know if Nick is still alive. We don't know anything about that. So it needs to say, um, you know, to Nick, 
Smith or um, something like that. So it's definitive. Um, an address is also helpful to put into the trust if it is an adult and you know that that's their permanent residence to put their address in the will. I mean, I'm so sorry. To put their address in the trust really helps define exactly who Nick is. But it's preferable to also put a last name. So all trusts um, are revocable living trusts unless made irrevocable. So when you create a trust, it's just automatically going to be a revocable one unless you specify that it is not. Most of, uh, I would say about most of the trusts created are revocable. I have not prepared a trust um, that was irrevocable upon execution. So the parties in the trust. The main three parties in a trust are settlers, trustees, and beneficiaries. So the settler are the people who create the trust and who own the trust property. So the settlers are Harry and Wendy. They created the trust, they own the real property, and that's their definition. Um, the term trust stores is also used, but because in this um, webinar we're also talking about trustees, I don't want to get confused, trust or trustees. So I chose settlers, but the term settlers and trustees is also interchangeable, and you'll see that pretty often. Trustees are those who administer the trust. Usually, um, settlers and trustees are the same upon creation. So Harry and Wendy will be settlers, but also trustees of the trust. Um, when you have successor trustees is when they pass or are incapacitated and somebody else needs to administer the trust. And lastly, we have beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are, again, the trustees and settlers upon execution because Harry and Wendy are creating this trust with their property. They are administering the trust as trustees and they created this trust for their benefit. And then upon their passing, um, for the benefit of their children, family, friends, things like that. Okay, so if I'm going too fast, please let me know. Um, as I previously said, it's my first webinar, so I might have a tendency to talk faster than I should. Okay, so the settler and trustees, oh yes, this is, um, pretty much what I just discussed. Settler is the trustee, and we don't have a successor trustee really until the um, original settler is incapacitated or passes. So for example, in Harry and Wendy's situation, they are settlers and they are trustees. Harry passes, and Wendy is the sole trustee either on her incapacity um, or her passing, then there will be a successor trustee. Whoever they have named in the trust will then take over and administer. OK, settlers' rights. So Harry and Wendy put their property into the trust, but that doesn't mean they can't really treat it as if it's not their own. It is their property. They are the settlers, they are the trustees, and they are the beneficiaries. So they can buy, sell, trade, do whatever. So they bought this real property, threw it into the trust. They decide they want to leave California and go buy something else in a different state or just leave the Bay Area and move inland or to SoCal. They can sell the trust, I mean, sell the property either in the name of the trust or in their individual name. It doesn't. I'll discuss that later, but the main point is it's still their property, even though they have named beneficiaries in the trust upon their death, um, the beneficiaries don't have a claim to those assets. So child one, two, or three can't say, hey, mom and dad, you can't sell that property because it's supposed to go to me. Um, Harry and Wendy have the right to pretty much do what they want with the property while it's revocable and while they're alive. Um, the only real difference is just you know, the title of it and having it in the name of the trust, but they still can treat it as their own. The 
difference is upon the settler's death. So Harry and Wendy pass, and child one is a successor trustee. So the child, um, child one, as successor trustee, has to administer the trust according to the terms of the trust and according to the probate code. So child one is able to sell that property, but they have to go through certain, certain circumstances, which I will also discuss later, but mainly they um, can't just sell it as if they were a Harry and Wendy, they have to abide by the terms of the trust. So if the trust says you cannot sell it, it needs to go directly to you three children as tenants in common, joint tenants, or those are the two options, um, then that's what child one as successor trustee needs to do. But in most instances, a trust allows a trustee and successor trustee to acquire, dispose, manage, develop, repair, alter, and lease a real property. So now we get to putting the property in the trust. So there are various ways to put the property in the trust. Um, first two are the best ways, and the third way is kind of a catch-all. So the first way to put a property in the trust is putting, listing it in a schedule. So you create a trust, Harry and Wendy create a trust, they at the end have a schedule it could be schedule a b or c um, and in schedule a say that's community property they put their real property schedule b is his separate property Harry's separate property so he might put his musical instruments or any stocks that he um, obtained prior to marriage or anything he owned same with wendy she might put um, any stocks that she has, or instruments, jewelry, anything like that. So it all depends. There can be multiple schedules, or there can just be one schedule. It kind of all depends on the people at the time that they create the trust. If it's a couple that's never, that has only been married to each other, most of the time they just have one schedule and it's Schedule A community property and they just kind of dump everything else in there. Um, if it's their second marriage and they have children from a previous marriage and they got married around in their 50s and they're creating another trust um, in this second marriage, most I've seen in those instances that there are multiple schedules because you have their community property, property that they just bought, and then um, Schedule B and C, which goes to their children from a previous marriage and property that they acquired you know, prior to this second marriage. And for listing items in the schedule, for real property, um, you put the address and I would also put the APN. And for other personal property such as jewelry, clothing, um, furniture, unless you think it needs to be specific, such as you want to give certain earrings to one child or a guitar to one child but the bass to another um, things like that then you should write it out separately otherwise you can just say all my home furnishings or all my clothes all my jewelry you don't have to make every single item that you own in the trust property you can just put it um, as a generic list So the second way to put a trust um, property, to put property into a trust is with a deed. So this usually happens with a, um, with real property. So Harry and Wendy created their trust. They put the property in Schedule A because it's their community property. They bought the house together and then they need to follow up that with a deed. So I've only usually used quick claim deeds, but there is also trust transfer deeds. And pretty much as long as it just transfers the property from Harry and Wendy as joint tenants or tenants in common or as husband and wife, um, 
as their community property. As long as it transfers to whatever it is as their individual, Harry and Wendy as whatever, to Harry and Wendy as trustees of the Smith Family Trust, that's what you really need to do. A lot of people feel that if they just name it in Schedule A, that's sufficient enough. I would follow up with um, a deed because it records it, it shows to the world that this property is in trust, and um, you just want to have that step followed so then upon your passing, the successor trustee doesn't need to go and have to deal with that because it's already in the name of the trust and everybody knows that this is a property that is part of this Smith Family Trust. Um, when you create the deed, you have to record it with the recorder's office. And um, there are situations where you're going to have to potentially transfer it in and out of the trust. It depends on your financial institution. So I've seen instances in which Carrie and Wendy have transferred the property into their trust. And then about 10 years later, they want to refinance, maybe to help child one go to college or what have you. And so they go to their banking institution and they say, well, we need you to transfer the property out of the trust into your names. Then we will refinance and then you can transfer it back into the trust. It's pretty normal, so I wouldn't be concerned about that. Um, it's just it's different for each banking institution. So. I would advise to talk to whoever you want to get a loan from, discuss with them what they need, and if the property is in trust, if you do in fact need to remove it and then throw it back in there. So the last way to put the property in a trust is a pour over will. This is a kind of catch-all situation. So all assets that are not in the name of the trust get poured into the trust by this will. The reason it's not that favorable is because you still have to go through the probate process. Um, and it, it's not like, oh, I have this property, but there's a trust. OK, we're just going to throw it into the trust. There are even more steps that you have to take. But it's good to create this will, this type of will, so that you can throw this property into the trust. And it's a faster probate process than just a regular probate. So, for example, Harry and Wendy bought real property, created the trust, have these children, and never updated it. And over 20 years, they bought two more pieces of property, and then both of them passed. Whoever is a successor trustee will then have to use their pour over will to probate the property that's not in the name of the trust because they never updated their trust. They didn't um, put the property in the trust in the schedule or um, with a deed. And so the successor trustee then has to go to the court, say, there's a trust, these properties based on this will this four over will, are to be part of the trust. So I'm going to, as the executor of this will, transfer these properties into the trust, to the trustee, to put them into the trust so they can be administered by the terms of the trust. So it's great because it is a catch-all in case you do forget um, or in case you don't update your trust with amendments. What I advise is that keep updating your trust if you can. So Harry and Wendy, they had their children, bought their house, and created their trust. Once their children are 18, they should update that because most likely the terms in the trust uh, dictate who takes care of the children in case anything happens to them. And so you can pretty much delete those sections and then focus on the children or other beneficiaries now that they're older. And so you can re revise um, the terms, you can revise the beneficiaries, you know, take one out, put one in. Um, and 
you can update your schedule of what is part of the trust. So now that Harry and Wendy are updating their trust because their children are over 18, they also bought a condo. So they will not only update the trust to remove the terms um, regarding the children if they were younger, but will now include this new condo. And so it really just is nice to keep it updated so then the executor of the portal of the will doesn't have to go through the probate process. It's fine if it happens, but it's just nice to update the trust if you can, at least every few years. Okay, so we are going to go into scenarios for selling a property out of trust. Okay, scenario one is kind of what I already talked about. All settlers are alive. So Harry and Wendy are alive. They bought a house, prepared a trust, and they decided they don't want to live in the Bay Area. They want to move to LA or they want to move inland, Tahoe, something. Um, they're just going to sell the property as if they owned it individually. Um, they can sell the property as trustees of the trust, or they can get the property out of trust, you know, quit claim it or transfer it back to their names as individuals, and then sell it that way. Um, either way, however they intend to sell the property, whether it's as an individual or as a trustee, the purchase, the contract with their agent needs to mirror how the property is held. So Harry and Wendy can't have the property be held by the trust, but then sign a bunch of documents as an individual. It needs to match each other. So if they do intend to change um, how the property is held right before selling it, they need to go through the proper channels, make sure that the property is recorded with its new title, make sure that their agent or in the title insurance company has a copy of that deed just in case they haven't updated their system enough, uh, I mean, frequently, uh, to catch this new uh, change and make sure that everybody is aware that they have moved the property from the trust to themselves as an individual before selling. Or they can just sell it as trustees of the trust. And they can fill out car forms or the PRDS in either capacity. So um, Harry's, if the property is held in a trust and um, they want to sell it as trustees, then all they need to do is sign as Harry Smith, comma, co-trustee of the Smith Family Trust stated blank. And Wendy would be Wendy Smith, comma, co-trustee of the Smith Family Trust, dated blank. And that's going to be their signature pretty much throughout most of their documents. So the second scenario is settler dies. One settler dies and we have a surviving settler. So in this situation, Harry passes and Wendy's still alive. So Wendy's in her house, that's held in the name of the trust. She's their surviving settler, and she decides that she wants to downsize. That the family home is just too big, the kids are out of the house, she just wants a quaint little house or a condo or something. So she's still the settler, and she's still the trustee. So as trustee, she does have the right to um, sell a property, manage the property or pretty much do what she wants um, with that property. However, in this situation, most likely she won't be able to transfer the property to herself as an individual. She will only have to be able to sell it as trustee of the trust. Um, and the reason why she can still sell it is because she is still a settler, trustee, and beneficiary. and Though the trust is becomes irrevocable upon Harry's death, she still is going to have um, more rights. The reason why is because in most marriage um, trusts, 
or family trusts, um, there is usually a provision that whoever survives can use the principal or income of the trust to continue their normal lifestyle for their health, maintenance, care, and well-being. So if they have to pretty much deplete everything in order to pay for medical bills and things like that, they have the right to do so. Um, and there's a difference between you know, selling everything and going on a luxurious vacation, which of course everyone likes to do, um, versus you know, paying medical bills. So Wendy in this situation would sell the family home to then use that money to buy a smaller house to take care of her as the settler beneficiary and as trustee, she has the right to do so. So in this situation, um, beneficiaries, so her children will still have no rights to the trust assets unless specifically stated. So I earlier said Harry and Wendy have the children, bought the house, then created the trust, and this is their first marriage. So in this scenario, it's most likely that there's not going to be uh, several schedules. There's just going to be Schedule A, which has everything that they own since they've been married, which includes this real property. And most likely, it'll transfer to an A and B trust, which um, she still has the right to do whatever she wants with her half. And then with what would be his half, um, she can dip into it if she needs to to care for herself. So those are called an A and B trust. Um, it depends on you know, who drafts it, whether the surviving person is A or um, has the B trust. And in this situation, Wendy would use all of the trust assets in her portion of the trust to care for herself. And then, if necessary, go after um, the funds in Harry's trust to take care of her. So this is where she can use the principal or income of the trust to make sure that she is fine. Um, and it's pretty common because, you know, if your spouse passes, the pa spouse who passed wants to make sure that their surviving spouse is cared for and does not, you know, go homeless or without medical care or food. So the whole point is creating this um, system to protect the survivor and to ensure that they are well cared for since you are no longer present. So we're going to have the scenario where now both Harry and Wendy have passed. So the trust is completely irrevocable, she's not taking anything anymore, and at this point is when the successor trustee steps in and administers the trust. So the successor trustee reviews the trust and um, pretty much administers it per the terms of the trust and per the code. But the trust is going to say, you know, child one gets this, child two gets this, child three gets that. Um, in most scenarios, um, there aren't specific, um, there aren't specific gifts. So it's, the trust says, all my children, all our children get an equal share of whatever trust assets are left. So for the scenario, everyone gets a third. There are instances where you can say child one gets music instruments, child two gets jewelry, child three gets art, the art paintings or sculptures. And then after that, everyone gets a one third of what's left. So it's not like it has to be a full generic, everyone gets a third or a half or one fourth, one fifth. Um, you can have specific um, gifts. And you can also do that with funds as well. So say Harry and Wendy gave $30,000 to child one so that child one can put a deposit down on a house. Well, they could write in the trust saying everybody gets a third, um, but we're going to take $30,000 away at the end from child one and split those funds to child two and three so then it's equal that everyone 
um, gets a share. Uh, I've seen that happen a lot, especially when parents do help their children with student loans, purchasing a home, purchasing a car, things like that. Um, and so it's very normal to have specific gifts with the generic, you get one third of whatever's left. Um, and successor trustees don't get to decide who gets what. It's all based on the terms of the trust. So if one beneficiary says, I deserve one third or I deserve more, the successor trustee can't really do anything about it. They are going to administer by the terms of the trust. Harry and Wendy said you get one third, you only get one third. That's kind of it. Um, the beneficiary does have some rights to kind of contest, but they have to go to court and seek an attorney if they want to do that. Okay, so now we're at the mechanics of selling out of a trust. So in this situation, for this last segment, I am going to discuss the situation that we just had, the third scenario where Harry and Wendy have passed, child one is the successor trustee and is going and is administering the trust per its terms and going to most likely sell the property. So first off, child one as successor trustee needs to review the trust to make sure that's okay. Um, so the terms of the trust will say that you can liquidate it or there will be an in-kind distribution. So, or both, you can do both. So um, if the trust just says everyone gets a third, it kind of leaves it up to the successor trustee and the beneficiaries to kind of figure out how that's gonna happen. So if there are three properties, everyone gets a third, okay, everyone gets a property. But then you have to take into consideration the value of each property. If each property is worth a million, everyone gets a property, that's great. Then we're done, easy peasy. Um, if one property is worth 500,000, another property is worth 3 million, and another property is worth 1 million, then there's going to be some, some transferring of some funds to make sure that everyone has an equal distribution by the end because the terms of the trust say so. Um, there can also be an in-kind distribution where Harry and Wendy have specifically said, you guys are going to get this property and you're not going to sell it. It's going to go to you three and you need to hold it for five years or something like that. Um, that can be a thing that the settlers decide. Um, but you never really know, and so that's why the first thing that a successor trustee needs to do is get a copy of the trust, review its terms, and figure out what they're allowed to do. Um, and then, once they do that, they should figure out the distribution plan. So whether they're going to sell everything and everyone gets cash, whether they're going to keep it, whether they're going to sell some, uh, get rid of, or sell some and keep some, such as selling um, all the home furniture, the jewelry, clothing, cars, but then keeping the property. Um, that plan, I always advise successor trustees to kind of discuss that with the beneficiaries so that um, it's an easier process. And especially if it's a family home or things that are personal, just deciding to sell them without discussing with the beneficiaries will cause hostility. So it's always better to kind of proceed forward with um, an open discussion and to kind of let everybody know the plan of action. Um, and you do have to, if you're going to sell a property, you do have to let them know what you're planning on doing. But I think a previous discussion on how you are going to administer the trust, what you're going to do, who gets what, how you're going to do it, the time frame, and things like that. Just keeping it open and honest is um, the best thing. Not only because most likely it prevents any 
future litigation regarding um, the beneficiary saying that you breached your duty as trustee. It just makes the process easier, especially because most likely the beneficiaries are the children and they are still in a grieving process. I have been in situations where parents have died 10 years previously and it's still a difficult topic uh, for some beneficiaries to discuss. So, you know, you never really know what you're kind of going into. Um, and so that's why I always advise try to keep the conversation flowing and talk to a trust and estates attorney to help guide you in that process. So how we're going to move forward is we have um, child one, child two, and child three have just agreed to sell um, Harry and Wendy's family home. They uh, don't live in the Bay Area anymore and though they would like to keep it, unfortunately they're just not here, their work's not here, and they're just going to sell it. Hopefully a new family takes over and they just get the proceeds. So first things first, child one is successor trustee and child one needs to prepare a certificate of trust. It is a document that you can take to financial institutions, to your agent, to pretty much anybody and say, I am the trustee of this trust. I can, and based on me being the trustee of this trust, I can open this bank account in the name of the trust. I can um, sell this property. I can pretty much, you know, do those things. Um, and whoever looks at that document can rely on it. And if they 100% believe, you know, oh, of course, uh, this person's a trustee and act on it, they're not going to be liable. Um, this is a way so that the successor trustee isn't passing around the family trust to banking institutions to people to read. Uh, you just have to give them a certificate of trust. And that should be sufficient enough to um, allow you to move forward with your process. I have seen situations in which um, an institution would like to have their in-house attorneys read a copy of the trust. It's not abnormal. Um, usually if uh, that happens, they give you an explanation of why they need a copy of the trust, that they just want to review it just to make sure. Um, so if that does happen, it's okay. Most likely you won't need it. A certificate is um, sufficient enough. But in this situation, because a certificate is so important and has specific requirements in order to be a valid certificate that you can use, um, I would have an attorney prepare it for you. So step one is preparing the certificate of trust. Oh, and this is whoever relies on it is not liable because they relied on the certificate of trust. So if, say, um, in this situation, child two went and opened a, prepared a certificate of trust, went to a bank, opened a bank account in the name of the trust, and then um, child one went and found out that child two opened this account. Well, that bank is not liable for opening the account because they relied on the representations of the certificate of trust. So, um, that you know protects those institutions as well and whoever else is relying on it from um, being liable. However, if they do say um, uh, an agent, a banking institution, or someone knew that child two was not the trustee, maybe because they were friends with child two or know the family dynamic or child two accidentally said something that indicated that they weren't the trustee, then at that point it gets a little dicey on whether they are or are not liable. Okay, so the second process of selling the property is to hire an agent. Um, the successor trustee should hire someone to sell the property pretty much no matter what. It's not a law that they should, 
but it's my recommendation that they should. Even if the successor trustee is the best agent, broker, they know the real estate market, they're top of their field, I pretty much say you should not sell the property as yourself. You need to hire someone else to do it. The reason why is because we don't want the other beneficiaries to argue that you breached your duty to avoid conflict because you profited from this deal. So let's say child one is an agent or broker and um, decided to sell the property themselves. Didn't hire anybody, sold it themselves. Um, they got a percentage of the sale. Child two and three can say, no, you're profiting off of that. You shouldn't have received that money. Um, you did not you breached your duty to avoid conflict of interest. And so now we're going to file a suit to remove you as trustee and appoint the next successor trustee, let's say child two, um, to appoint child two as trustee to administer the remaining funds. And then they might further see you to, um, not further see And then they might also say that money that you received from the sale needs to be put back in the trust. So to avoid all of that, hire somebody else. Um, it just keeps the lines clean. It makes it so that there isn't distrust between the parties. Um, if there is a situation where you 100% want to sell it yourself because you have the skill, you have the knowledge, and your siblings, child two and three, say, yep, I'm totally fine with it. I think it's great. If you're in that instance, I would say um, that you create an agreement where whatever money you make from that sell goes into back to the trust or that you split it equally or something so that it really demonstrates that you are not attempting to profit because, you know, January 1st, you guys had a great holiday. Um, they agree that you can sell it. And then come June, they got mad at you for some reason and you already sold the property, you already got your commission, and now they're gonna sell, they're gonna sue you for your actions. So in order to make sure that you um, have a solid um, counter to any claim for a breach of your duty, I would either not keep the money and throw it back into the trust, or if you do have the money, um, split it between you guys equally. And that's just to, you know, make sure that no one can really say that you breached your duty because you profited. Um, and then <coughs> um, after you guys have hired a agent to sell the property, now it's time to prepare the property for market and sale. So child one goes and sells property and decides we need you know, new paint, take out the carpet, or they could just not do anything. Um, at that point, I advise successor trustees to discuss with the beneficiaries and whatever agent that they've hired on what they should do to repair the property to get it um, ready for market and sale. In some situations, you might decide that you wanna do a lot, or you might just want to throw on some fresh paint and call it a day. It all depends on you and what is available from the trust funds. So Harry and Wendy not only had real property, they had several bank accounts. Uh, Child one, a successor trustee, is looking to sell the property. Um, there's about $50,000 in the bank accounts, so um, which Child one as successor trustee has already obtained them and thrown those funds into a trust bank account, um, which is a bank account in the name of the trust, which child one's trust attorney would help them set up. Um, so they go to the property, realize there's about $20,000 worth of work that they want to do before putting the property on MLS. So the trustee, the successor trustee can pull the funds from that trust bank account. If there aren't really any funds, then um, 
you don't have to make any repairs or cosmetic changes. It's completely up to you. It's not something that's required. It's just something that's kind of common. So if there aren't funds to, um, to make any repairs, don't feel like you have to. If child one says we ran out of funds because we had to pay for Wendy's medical bills, that's fine. And you can just sell the property as is. Um, there are situations where a beneficiary trustee can use their own money to pay for these costs and then be reimbursed by the trust. You can do that. Um, if you are going to do that, I would be very open about that decision so that all of the beneficiaries are aware of why you're getting paid back later so that there isn't a misunderstanding. Okay. So child one, a successor trustee, got an agent, got the property ready for sale, and now the property is on the MLS. Um, so what's their duty as trustee to um, potential buyers? Um, the agent is going to complete the CAR trust advisory form. This is a form that you provide to potential buyers, which lets the buyer be aware that who is selling on the property didn't own it, didn't live there, is a trustee of a trust. And so that they, as buyer, will not receive certain disclosures that you would normally get in a regular individual to individual sale. Um, and there are certain exemptions, which is the next slide that I will show you, um, which means that the trustee does not have to disclose certain things. And it all kind of it doesn't change whether child one went to the property, you know, every Sunday for a family dinner, or went to the property only on holidays, you know, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, or has not been to the property for years because they live abroad or something like that. So it all is kind of the same, where they are a trustee of the trust, they are exempt from having to provide certain disclosures. And um, they should not complete these certain disclosures. So the next slide, um, here, I'm sorry, not that one. Here are the disclosures that are exempt. It's the real estate transfer disclosure statement and seller's property questionnaire. Those are the two main ones I'm going to focus on. There's a whole list on the CAR trust advisory form that says, you know, here are all the exemptions that you don't have to complete. But these are the two that I've seen uh, trustees complete where they shouldn't have. And the reason why um, is because, we're going to go back two slides, is because they will be held to the same standard as the homeowner um, or as an individual in a normal sale. So those two forms um, are make the homeowner um, liable for disclosing under Civil Code Section 1102. So if there was a flood on the property, if the property normally floods, if there was mold, if um, there are grading issues, easement issues, things like that, a homeowner, a normal homeowner, should know what's wrong with their property, what's going on with the property. Um, and a trustee most likely isn't. And so that's why trustees are exempt from completing those forms because they don't know. However, if they do complete those forms, then a potential buyer could go after them under 1102 because they um, made themselves susceptible by completing those forms. So, so trustees are exempt from completing those forms. However, they still have a common law duty to disclose things that they are aware of. So in this instance, that's where the frequency of the trustees, um, the frequency that the trustee visited the property comes into effect. So because they have a common law duty. So um, trust, uh, child one visited the property every week for Sunday dinner. They knew, um, they don't know everything, but they knew um, 
the back door doesn't really close properly. That you gotta jimmy with it before you can open or close it. That um, during winter, the garage door kind of gets stuck because it gets too cold. Um, they know maybe that the fireplace, again, during winter um, gets clogged. I'm trying to think of other things. Um, they might have known that after a family dinner, they were filling up the dishwasher and the dishwasher started leaking and then the whole kitchen flooded. So things like that, they're going to need to disclose to potential buyers. But they should not disclose them on either of these two forms, the real estate transfer disclosure statement or the seller's property questionnaire. What I advise is for, um, what I advise is for uh, agents to provide these documents to the trustee and say, hey, review these documents, see if they spark any um, memory, knowledge, things like that, um, to kind of get you to think of what's been going on with the property. Don't complete them, um, but have them spark your memory and then on a separate document, you know, Word document, handwrite it, if you need to, but I prefer, you know, typed document um, saying, you know, uh, here are the things that I remember from visiting the property. Um, not sure if they're material or not, but, you know, this is for me to complete my common law duty and then list everything. You know, back in 2010, uh, we put too much soap in the dishwasher and then there was soap everywhere in the kitchen um, or the soap pump broke during one of the heavy rains in February and the basement flooded. Um, we were hanging, a lot of this has to do with winter because we are in winter and a lot of things, problem things happen in the winter, but um, we're hanging Christmas lights and I actually, I as trustee who was hanging them on uh, parents' house, fell and took out some shingles and the gutter or the, trim on the uh, roof and I don't know who replaced them but I broke them um, so things like that oh um, breaking a window that's pretty normal I pulled it down too hard and it broke but I fixed it um, so things that you can remember so look at the doc have the trustee look at these documents spark their memory and then just start writing on something else so that they are fulfilling their common law duty to disclose material facts, but are not subjecting themselves to civil code section 1102. And then um, there are other um, exemptions, but those are the main two that I've seen. Um, so that's why I didn't really talk about them that much. Um, and then, for um, the agents in the situation, um, as an agent of a trustee, I would pray, I would be very open about who your seller is. So tell the potential buyer's agent that it's a trustee sale. If you ever talk to the buyers themselves, tell them that it's a trustee sale. Um, just inform all parties, even if you have to tell them five times, just make sure everybody around you knows what the situation is, make sure that the um, trust, the car trust advisory form is provided early on um, and let them know that certain disclosures will not be provided. Even though it says it on the trust advisory form that, you know, seller's property questionnaire, the TDS, earthquake, um, all of that's not gonna be provided, I would still try to follow up with saying these will not be provided. Um, either in a follow-up email or in multiple conversations just to make sure that, again, everyone's aware. Um, and then I would also get extensive um, inspections on the property. I know that there are normal home inspections that you get. You get the report and you provide it to the potential buyer. But since these uh, certain forms cannot be completed, I would get a more intensive report. So just already get a mold report. You don't know that mold's um, in there. Nobody knows because they don't live there. 
but just get one. And then um, same with if there's um, general contractor, I've seen um, in reports that the home inspector says, this looks kind of fuzzy, uh, I would get a general contractor out here to take a deeper look. So get that general contractor out there to take a deeper look. Not sure on what, could be foundation, it could be the roof, um, it could be just the piping in the kitchen um, where you just get a plumber. I'm not entirely sure, but I would just take that extra step to make sure that everyone has as much disclosure as they possibly can and that um, you know you and the successor trustee are um, you know taken care for by having all these steps covered and doing even a little more. And then the last thing is, okay, you give your uh, you give your disclosures that you can. Um, you give the second document that the trustee provided in Word or however they want to, um, and the sale goes through. So at that point, um, the trustee is going to need to complete the escrow instructions, and so that's when the trustee has to direct the funds to the trust bank account. So this trust bank account is usually is, is opened prior to the sale, pretty much open if it's not already created, and then you just transfer the name into the successor trustee from Harry and Wendy. You transfer it to um, child one, or child one just has to open it themselves. Um, it's done pretty much as one of the first things to do in a trust administration. So it should already be opened. If it's not, then talk to your trust attorney and get the EIN or TIN, you know, this process is the same on the IRS website, to get that number, go to a bank, and have a bank account opened in the name of the trust. So successor trustee will um, take that number, go to the bank and say, I would like to open a bank account with the following name, um, child one as trustee of the Smith family trust dated blank. And that's going to be the name of the trust. And it's going to be held by the successor trustee. And then if that successor trustee passes and child two has to administer and take over, they take their certificate of trust, go to the bank, say, hey, first person passed. I'm the new trustee. Transfer that bank account into my name in the sense of um, it's going to be child two as it's going to be held by child two but it's still trustee of the Smith Family Trust dated blank. Um, and then at that point, the funds are in there and you just distribute it based on the terms of the trust. And most likely your trust attorney is going to assist you on that type of distribution um, and any you know, reports and other, other duties that you as trustee have to do um, to complete the process and finish administering the trust and um, pretty much be done. So that's um, the close. And I was wondering if you guys have um, any questions. So the first question is um, how to handle a sale slash distribution of real estate that's in trust but on lease land? Any complications? Okay, so the property, uh, follow up question to that, is it a home on lease property? All right, I guess that doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so it's lease land. What I would want to know is how that lease is held. Um, is it for, is it a life estate? Is it a 20 year, 30 year? Um, usually if you have, if, and then who has also leased it? Was it the individual or was it the trust? Um, I, 
haven't done this before, so I'm kind of just speaking out loud, and I would definitely on this situation uh, double check. But from my understanding, is if um, O leases land to A, then A puts that lease land either for 30 years or um, for their life into it. Well, actually, it doesn't work as a life estate now that I'm thinking about it. Okay, um, backtrack. O leases to A for 30 years. A puts the property in a trust. A dies five years in, and the trust distributes that lease to their beneficiaries. So the beneficiaries can actually come in and they will be the lessees. O is still the lessor. When it comes to sale, though, um, I don't think that they would really be able to sell because it's a lease and not ownership. So A, just himself, wouldn't be able to sell the property to anybody else because he's leasing it. He's a leasee. He might be able to sublease, so that might be something that the um, beneficiaries of A would be able to do. But I would first have to review the lease, then um, figure out what the terms of the trust are, and then see what they see what the beneficiaries want to do, and lastly, legal research. So I hope that helps with that question. Um, does the trust need an EIN? Yes, pretty much standard, um, because the trust does have um, some tax implications, um, which could either be paid for by the trust. Most of the time, it's distributed out to the uh, beneficiary, so they just take the tax hit, and the trust doesn't have to pay taxes. But if you want to open a bank account or pretty much do anything, you are going to have to have an EIN. So if you create it, if Harry and Wendy created it once they first opened the trust, um, they could do that. Or most people don't create it because they don't have, they have yet to transfer their um, bank accounts into the name of the trust. So the successor trustee uh, usually creates it, but it does need to happen. Uh, next question is, would you still get the mold report if you intend to sell as is? Yes. Especially up here, um, in the past three years that I've worked up here, uh, mold is something um, that is exceptionally common. I would say we get about a week, every week there's another mold issue, especially with heavy rains. Um, I would say last year we had those pretty heavy rains in January, February, and March, and then starting May, just one to two a week, we're coming in with uh, mold-related issues. So tenants were coming in, landlords, homeowners, um, people with the HOA, it's just a huge thing. So especially up here, I would get a mold report no matter what because um, it covers you. You can let them know if there is mold in the property. You can remediate it and then um, have a second follow-up report. So if they do come back later on and say, you sold me a house with mold, you're completely covered. Um, if you're in more of the desert and SoCal, would I think that's necessary? Probably not, but for how much mold I've seen up here, I would always get a mold report and just always talk about uh, getting a mold report on anything. Um, other question, is there only one successor trustee or can there be multiple co-trustees? There can be multiple. So in my scenario, I made it easier just by having Harry and Wendy as settlers and trustees, and then once they both died, um, just have one successor trustee. But you can have co-trustees. So there, I've seen situations where Harry and Wendy, um, once Harry passed, um, there always needs to be two trustees. So, so Wendy was trustee, and then child one got appointed to co-trustee. 
And then once Wendy passed, then child two got appointed to co-trustee. It all depends on um, what the settlers decide, if they just want one child to do it or if they want two, child, two children. Or again, you don't have to pick your children. You can pick um, friends or another family member to administer, but you can opt for one to two, uh, one, two, or even three co-trustees. I would not do three though. Um, do settlers have to be married? Can you discuss if they are not married? Uh, they do not have to be married. So you can, Harry and Wendy don't have to be married. They can just be boyfriend and girlfriend. They bought a property. Properties held um, in, as tenants in common, and um, they decide to create a trust. So, in the trust, they're going to have to say that they are individuals, they are not married, and um, then just go through the terms. So, at that point, they're each going to have their own schedule because there is no community property in the situation. So, Harry will have Schedule A or B, Wendy will have the opposite, and the same generic list of all my furniture, clothing, things like that. Um, if they want to create a schedule for things that they purchase together, they can, but it's not going to be community property. So what I would advise them is for Harry and Wendy, for each of their schedules, um, list their one half interest in the property that they purchased together um, versus trying to have a third schedule because they don't own it together as a community property. They It's part of their separate property. And also, um, friends can have a trust together. Siblings can have a trust together. It's just pretty common for married couples to do it, but you do not have to be married. Um, Okay, next question. Regarding the need to inform all parties, do you suggest that the MLS listing state that it will be a trustee sale? If not, when should parties be informed? When showing the property or at open house? Um, I think it should be on the MLS because some people might want to just completely avoid uh, that whole process of purchasing from a trust. They might want somebody who actually lived at the property, who cared for the property, so that they can talk to them more versus, oh, I'm just selling my dad's property. I don't really know what to tell you. Um, so I do think it should be on the MLS. If it's not on the MLS by choice or whatever, um, it needs to be one of the first things uh, disclosed as it's part of the packet. Um, so it will be disclosed at some point, but if you want the process to be easier, I always think to do it um, as soon as possible. So for me, I would say put it on the MLS. If it's not there, then whoever is um, showing the property or if there's a buyer who's already interested, make that very clear from the beginning. Okay, so this is going to be our second to last question. Um, does transferring into a trust cost for a transfer tax charge? Also, if the client sells a home, do they get to keep their capital gain waiver on their primary home? Okay, so unfortunately, we don't provide tax advice. Um, we advise that you speak with your CPA, and especially in this type of situation, um, your trust and estate's attorney um, because there could be instances in which you are able to um, avoid certain taxes because you are selling from the trust and then you are purchasing a new property from the trust um, and it doesn't really go to you as an individual. Um, there might be certain tax implications that the trust is out of. Um, or I can avoid or take the hit themselves and not you as an individual. So it all depends on kind of the circumstances. And unfortunately, because the question is really broad um, and I'm not uh, experienced with the tax laws, 
as they also changed last year, um, I would speak with a CPA or whoever prepares your um, taxes, doesn't have to be a CPA, um, tax attorney, and your trust and estates attorney. Okay, so here is the last question. Can a property be in more than one trust or can you put a partial interest in a trust? Okay, good question. So in this situation, we're gonna have Harry and Wendy, um, they passed, child one, instead of selling the property, they distributed in kind to child one, two, and three. So each of them gets a third and they decided to hold it as tenants in common. Um, as tenants in common, child one, so it gets moved from the Smith Family Trust to child one uh, as an individual in tenants in common with child two as an individual tenants in common, child three as an individual tenants in common, um, or whichever language you choose. But in the end, it's gonna be to them as an individual. From that point, they get to do whatever they want. So if child one now has an individual wants to put their one third interest into their family trust, they can go ahead and do so um, because they each own their own interest. When they decide to sell the property, then um, they child one can sign documents as trustee of child one's family trust dated blank. Um, child two can sell as themselves as an individual and same with child three, whatever they decide to do. Um, and then that's pretty much it, but that would not work if they were in joint tenants. So if Harry and one, if child one distributed to themselves, child one, two, and three as joint tenants, then one of them, if they did want to move it into their own trust, would transfer their interest into their trust, which then breaks the joint tenancy, and then they have a tenants in common and their one-third interest. But either way, you can do that. Okay, so I think that was our last question. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending uh, my very first webinar. I hope that uh, I spoke clearly and uh, not too quickly and please reach out to me if you have any further questions or if you need any advice on um, transferring property into trust selling or just your overall kind of what to do in this situation um, and i just want to remind you that this recording will be distributed later this week and to uh, contact us if you haven't seen it by, if it hasn't been distributed by at least next Monday or Tuesday. So hope you guys have a great Thursday and thank you again.